Into the Wild by that guy, John Krakauer. I've taken the time after reading this book a couple times to make an ASMR digest of it because it's it's a brilliant book and you guys need to read this and if not read it you need to um, you need to hear the story it's really compelling it's in a nutshell it's about well I have a couple passages I wanted to read first that really set the tone and mood of it I guess it's about the idealism of youth and the uh, the passion that we tend to forget as we get older, which I um, <clears throat> I uh, I sympathize with being at that age right about now. So we're going to uh, going to start with a nice little paragraph. It is hardly unusual for a young man to be drawn to a pursuit considered reckless by his elders. Engaging in risky behavior is the rite of passage in our culture no less than in most others danger is always held as certain allure that in large part is why so many teenagers drive too fast and drink too much and take too many drugs why it has always been so easy for nations to recruit young men to go to war it can be argued that youthful daring is in fact evolutionarily adaptive a behavior encoded in our genes. McCandless, the protagonist of this true story, in his fashion merely took risk taking to its logical extreme. Um, yeah, that was a lot more well put than I could have put it. Uh, and then, then one last uh, bit before we jump into this because uh, it's actually a really short book. But uh, I'm just going to gloss it. I'm just going to highlight the uh, the key elements of the plot of uh, of his journey. You know, and I say protagonist and plot and all these literary terms, but really, um, this was a uh, uh, an American man who graduated college from Atlanta in 1990, and uh, was a brilliant student at a you know high almost a 4.0 GPA and uh, and I, I uh, generally with family issues at at the foundation of of it he left his family uh, hanging he didn't he didn't contact him for well after 1990 he didn't contact him ever again uh, because he died he died two years after wandering uh, America hitchhiking having little if n no possessions and um, and partly making a journal um, but uh, the author of this book John Krakauer <coughs> excuse me he uh, he backtracked tra this boy's steps and uh, he was only 24 when he died. I'm already older than that, so it's 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 uh, very poignant to me. But um, uh, last little passage before we start, this the author's buddy said, Roman. He said Roman's observation underscores how difficult it is for those of us preoccupied with the humdrum concerns of adulthood to recall how forcefully we were once buffeted by the passions and longings of youth. 
as Everett Roos's father. Everett Roos being another, I guess, early 1900s um, adolescent uh i guess i guess uh you might you might say oddball but uh but passionate about uh, wandering alone into the wild and uh then wanting to uh really shirk what young adults my age his age are supposed to do at that age which is get careers and you know have a family and some of that nonsense um he says as Everett Roos's father mused years after his 20 oh 20 year old son vanished in the desert the older person does not realize the soul flights of the adolescent I think we all poorly understood Everett yeah the soul flights of the adolescent that's what this book's about Um, and again, I'm not not reading the whole thing, so don't don't uh, don't make an audio book out of it or, or anything like that. Don't expect every detail. But uh, to me, I've read the book a couple times already, and the book itself has, um, like I say, it's short, but I, I think just touching upon the you know the key aspects of it are. Um, are impactful enough uh, to uh, to take away a lot from the story and of course I'm sure if you haven't read the book or heard of it I'm sure you've heard of the movie it came out in 2007 directed by Sean Penn um, had uh, Emil Hirsch and uh, what's his name Vince Vaughn and a lot a lot of other people William Hurt played the dad I believe uh, it was, that's actually I heard about the movie before I heard about the book here. Um, I recommend everyone go see that if you haven't. It's uh, it's one of the better movies out there. So the book starts off with uh, with a passage that I actually will read here, and uh, it says April twenty seventh, nineteen ninety two. One of the last letters this kid ever sent. His name's Christopher McCandless. This is one of the last letters he ever sent anybody. And this was his uh, his friend that, that gave him work in uh, a small town called Carthage, South Dakota. April 27th, 1992. Greetings from Fairbanks, Alaska. This is the last you shall hear of me. Wayne. He's talking to Wayne. Arrived here two days ago. It was very difficult to catch rides in the Yukon Territory. But I finally got here. Please return all mail I received to the sender. It might be a very long time before I return south. If this adventure proves fatal and you don't ever hear from me again, I want you to know you're a great man. I now walk into the wild. Alex. Uh, which is uh, a pseudonym he he took on uh, while he was traveling for some reason he called himself Alexander Supertramp and uh, decided to get rid of the name Christopher McCandless so uh, <clears throat> so it starts Jim Galleon had driven four miles out of Fairbanks when he spotted the hitchhiker standing in the snow beside the road Thumb raised high, shivering in the gray Alaska dawn. He didn't appear to be very old, 18, maybe 19 at most. A rifle protruded from the young man's backpack, but he looked friendly enough. Hitchhiker swung his pack into the bed of the ford and introduced himself as Alex. Alex? Galleon responded, fishing for a last name. Just Alex. The young man replied, pointedly rejecting the bait. He wasn't carrying anywhere near as much food and gear as you'd expect a guy to be carrying for that kind of trip, Galleon recalls. Galleon wondered whether he'd picked up one of those crackpots from the lower 48. 
who come north to live out ill-considered Jack London fantasies. Alaska has been long has long been a magnet for dreamers and misfits, people who think the unsullied enormity of the last frontier will patch all the holes in their lives. The bush is an unforgiving place, however, that cares nothing for hope or longing. The more they talked, the less Alex struck Galleon as in that case. He was congenial, seemed well-educated. He peppered Galleon with thoughtful questions about the kind of small game that lived in the country, kinds of berries he could eat, that kind of thing. Still, Galleon was concerned. He had no axe, no bug dope, no shoes, or at least none that could fit in the, uh, survive the, the harsh Alaska winter. No compass. The only navigational aid, aid in his possession was a tattered state road map he'd scrounged at a gas station. As the trucker as the truck lurched over a bridge, crossed the Nanana River, Alex looked down at the swift current and remarked that he was afraid of the water. A year ago, down in Mexico, he told Galleon, I was out in the ocean in a canoe. Almost drowned when a storm came up. Galleon, Galleon thought the hitchhiker's scheme was foolhardy and tried repeatedly to, to uh, dissuade him. I said, the hunting wasn't easy where he was going. They can go for days without killing any game. When that didn't work, I tried to scare him with bear stories. I told him 22 probably wouldn't do anything, except make a grizzly mad. Alex didn't seem too worried. I'll climb a tree, he says. So I explained that trees don't grow real big in that part of the state, that a bear could knock down one of them skinny little black spruce without even trying. But he wouldn't give an inch. He had an answer for everything I threw at him. Galleon asked whether he had a hunting license. Hell no, Alex scoffed. How I feed myself is none of the government's business. Fuck their stupid rules. There was just no talking the guy out of it, Galleon remembers. He was determined. Real gung-ho. The word that comes to mind is excited. He couldn't wait to head out there and get started. Yeah. This, uh... This was the last guy to ever see Alex alive, or Chris, and uh, apparently he picked him up near Fairbanks, Alaska, and gave him a ride about 20 miles out to uh, to a remote area in between a national forest. It's literally, well, yeah, why not show you a map? Um, and uh, gave him a, gave him his boots. I guess I guess they don't they don't have a uh, a close up map of it right now. Hmm, we got it. Nope. Well, maybe I'll I'll put something up later. Um, but yeah, he was he was hiking out and he uh, just dropped him off and. Uh, really really didn't think he was prepared and yet this kid ended up surviving for months uh what was it three months two months yeah it was like three or four months like 100 days uh so uh anyways he says <clears throat> alex insisted on giving galleon his watch his comb and what he said was all of his money 85 cents and loose change i don't want your money galleon protested and i already have a watch if you don't take it, I'm going to throw it away, Alex cheerfully retorted. I don't want to know what time it is. I don't want to know the day or where it is or where I am. None of that matters. And Alex pulls a camera from his backpack and asks Galleon to snap a picture of him shouldering his rifle at the trailhead. Then, smiling broadly, he disappeared down the snow-covered track. The date? The date was Tuesday, April 28, 1992. I figured he'd be okay. Galleon explains, I thought he'd probably get hungry pretty quick and just walk to the highway. That's what any normal person would do. Oh, well, it's right here. Okay, so. Let's see if we can get that in there. 
there we are. So where it says the abandoned bus, that is where he died, and that's where he was residing mostly. Um, in Healy, sorry, the town was Healy, it wasn't Fairbanks. Um, but you see Healy right there. And, uh, and over here is where uh, is basically almost central Alaska there. And the, oh, I keep getting the pages mixed up, the sides, uh, all in here, all up in here is an actual state park. And where the bus was, was right between a little finger that went into the state park that was not considered part of the park and, uh, and wasn't actually patrolled. Um, as a park would normally be or normally is so that's one of the reasons he uh, he died alone because um, he wasn't able to to get help in time and, and we'll get to why he died or how he died I mean I'm sure it's not a it might not be a surprise for most of you but uh, but it's really uh, really doesn't matter if you know the ending it's it's really the story as, as you always hear that that phrase, you know, it's, it's how you get there. It's not it's not where you end up. But uh, for this this story, it really was how he got there. I mean, this kid in two years he lived more than well. I think I said that in one of my other podcasts. But he he did live more than most people probably do in a life. So uh, This, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I got a little, a little, little guideline I want to follow too. Uh, let's see, because the book is, is very non-chronological, so I had to, uh, it took me a little while to, to actually outline it, because I want to just give it to you chronologically, it's the easiest way to understand it, especially if you're not, you know, sitting here actually reading it. Um, okay. And, uh, oh, and just to just keep my voice from drying out in honor of Cinco de Mayo, because this book has nothing to do with, well, actually it does have a part about Mexico we'll get into pretty shortly. Um, other than that, it has nothing to do with Cinco de Mayo, so let's, uh, let's cheers with a dosa keys instead, okay? <laughs> I'll pretend you just cheers me every time I drink. Um, Jack London is king. Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. Says graffito carved into a piece of wood discovered at the site of Chris McCandless's death. He uh, he carried some books. I think it was like eight or nine books with him into that bus or into the wild. And uh, for two years, actually, he carried around the same books, most of them. Uh, Jack London, uh, Henry David Thoreau, um, and even a couple other ones that says, like, uh, Michael Crichton and some other uh, little fiction books and stuff. But uh, he was he was certainly influenced by Jack London. Uh, it was masterful. It was the masterful and incommunicable wisdom of eternity laughing at the futility of life and the effort of life. It was the wild, the savage, the frozen-hearted Northland wild, Jack London and White Fang. I love love how uh, this guy, he's a, uh, mostly, he started off as an outdoor columnist for the magazine outside. He's like a mountain climber. He's a real, uh, real mountain climbing enthusiast, so... Um, just generally you wouldn't expect someone like that to be uh, extremely well read and you know what not but every chapter he starts off here's an example this is uh, we're already at the second chapter here it's it's a real quick easy read so that's why I figured I can do maybe one or two episodes we'll, we'll finish it he starts off with a you know like a little Jack London quote right there um, and he throws in philosophy into of course everyone who's familiar with my channel knows uh, that's what turns me on uh, 
so uh, I, I hope I hope you get the same out of it as, as I do because it, it's awesome how it just all connects and everything's very relevant very relevant all the phrases and stuff so anyways let's get those out of the way and uh, this is a quick passage about the the actual bus he died and how it got out there this uh, the bus 142 it was called in these days it isn't usual for six or seven months to pass without a bus seeing a human visitor but in early September 1992, six people in three separate parties happened to visit the remote vehicle on the same afternoon. Ken Thompson, the owner of an Anchorage auto body shop, George Samuel, his employee, and their friend Ferdy Swanson, a construction worker, set out for the bus on September 6th, 1992, stalking moose. It was late afternoon by the time they arrived at the bus. When they got there, according to Thompson, they found a guy and a girl from Anchorage standing 50 feet away looking kind of spooked. Neither of them noticed, or excuse me, neither of them had been in the bus, but they'd been close enough to notice a real bad smell coming from inside. A makeshift signal flag, a red knitted leg warmer of a sort worn by dancers was knotted to the end of an alder branch by the vehicle's rear exit. The door was ajar, and taped to it was a disquieting note, handwritten in neat block letters on a page torn from a novel by Nikolai Gogol. It read, S.O.S. I need your help. I'm injured. Near death. Too weak to hike out of here. I'm all alone, and this is no joke. It's double underscored. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I'm going out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you. Chris McCandless. August. With a question mark. The Anchorage couple had been too upset by the implication of the note and the overpowering odor of decay to examine the bus's interior. So Samuel steeled himself and took a look. A peek through a window revealed a Remington rifle. A plastic box of shelves, eight or nine paperback books, some torn jeans, cooking utensils, a backpack. In the very rear of the vehicle, on a jerry-built bunk, was a blue sleeping bag that appeared to have something or someone inside it, although Samuel says it was hard to be absolutely sure. I stood on a stump, Samuel continues, reached through a back window and gave the bag a shake. There was definitely something in it, but whatever it was, it didn't weigh much. It wasn't until I walked around to the other side and saw a head sticking out that I knew for certain what it was. Chris McCandless had been dead for two and a half weeks. At 8.30 the next morning, a police helicopter touched down noisily besides the bus, or beside the bus in a blizzard of dust and swirling aspen leaves. The troopers made a cursory examination of the vehicle in his environs for a sign of, of foul play, and then departed. When they flew away, they took McCandless's remains, a camera with five rolls of exposed film, the SOS note, and a diary, written across the last two pages of a field guide to edible plants. This diary recorded the young man's final weeks in 113 terse, enigmatic entries. The body was taken to Anchorage, where an autopsy was performed at the Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory. The remains were so badly decomposed that it was impossible to determine exactly what McCandless, how McCandless and when he died. But the coroner could find no sign of massive internal injuries or broken bones. Virtually no subcutaneous fat remained on the body, and the muscles had withered significantly in the days or weeks prior to the death. At the time of the autopsy, McCandless's remains weighed 67 pounds. Starvation was posited as the most probable cause of death. McCandless's signature had been penned at the bottom of an SOS note, or the SOS note that I just read, and the photos, when developed, included many self-portraits. But because he had been carrying no identification, the authorities didn't know who he was, where he was from, or why he was there. You 
Here's a quote from Leo Tolstoy from, uh, from a, a book or a passage called Family Happiness. I wanted movement and not a calm course of existence. I wanted excitement and danger and the chance to sacrifice myself for love. I felt in myself a superabundance of energy, which found no outlet in our quiet life. This was a, uh, a passage highlighted in one of the books found with Chris McCandless's remains. And then, um, yeah, this, this is actually a quote they used in the movie by Wallace Stegner in, in a book called The American West as Living Space. It should not be denied that being footloose has always exhilarated us. It is associated in our minds with escape from history and oppression and law and irksome obligations, with absolute freedom, and the road has always led west. So in Carthage, South Dakota, populations, hmm, population is 274 at the time of this book. I believe, uh, I believe he wrote the book in, uh, 1996 kid died in 1992 i believe so i'm sure the population's a little bit bigger but uh it's a sleepy little cluster of clapboard houses tidy yards weathered brick storefronts rising humbly from the immensity of northern plains set adrift in time stately rows of cottonwood shade a grid of streets seldom disturbed by moving vehicles there's one grocery one bank, a single gas station, a loan bar, the cabaret is what the bar is called, where Wayne Westerberg is sipping a cocktail and chewing on a sweet cigar, remembering the odd man he knew as Alex. These are what Alex used to drink, he says, with a frown, swirling the ice in his white Russian. He used to sit right there at the end of the bar and tell us these amazing stories of his travels. He could talk for hours. A lot of folks in town got pretty attached to old Alex. Kind of a strange deal what happened to him. In the fall of 90, he was wrapping up the season in north central Montana, cutting barley for cores in Anheuser-Busch. On the afternoon of September 10th, driving out of Cut Bank, after buying some parts for a manufacturing combine, he pulled over a hitchhiker, or for a hitchhiker, an amiable kid. Said his name was Alex McCandless. McCandless was smallish, with the hard, stringy physique of an itinerant laborer. There was something arresting about the youngster's eyes, dark and emotive. They suggested a trace of exotic blood in his heritage, Greek, maybe, or Chippewa and conveyed a vulnerability that made Westerberg want to take the kid under his wing. Ten minutes after picking up McCandless, Westerberg stopped in the town of Etheridge to deliver a package to a friend. He offered us both a beer, says Westerberg, and asked Alex how long it's been since he'd ate. Alex allowed. It had been a couple days and said he'd kind of run out of money. Overhearing this, the friend's wife insisted on cooking Alex a big dinner which he wolfed down and fell asleep at the table. He gave McCainless... Westerberg gave McCainless employment at the grain elevator and rented him a cheap room in one of the two houses he owned. <clears throat> he noticed about Alex, he never quit in the middle of something. If he started a job, he'd finish it. It was almost like a moral thing for him. He was what you'd call extremely ethical. He set pretty high standards for himself. You could tell right away Alex was intelligent. Westberg reflected as he uh, drained his third drink. He read a lot. He used a lot of big words. I think maybe part of what got him into trouble was that he did too much thinking. Sometimes he tried too hard to make sense of the world, to figure out why people were bad to each other so often. A couple of times I tried to tell him it was a mistake to get too deep into that kind of stuff.
But Alex got stuck on things. He always had to know the absolute right answer before he could go on to the next thing. And, uh, yeah, as you can see, I, I sort of mark up the book here and there, but uh, that that one phrase there, really, uh, I really empathize with. He always had to know the absolute right answer before he could go on to the next thing. It's 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 a more of a vice than a virtue, I think. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I I wrap my mind around things too too often, um, too deeply, and it sometimes it it helps in the long run, I guess, to uh, to comprehend what I'm thinking about. But sometimes, you know, you just get just get stuck in the same. Uh, rabbit hole you know you don't really uh, find an ending kind of opens your mind I guess to different ways of thinking if you if you keep harping on the same thing and come at it from different angles but uh, but yeah I don't know I don't know there's there's a lot about this kid that I uh, that I see myself in and I'm sure a lot of you out there will will too um, so it's interesting you know what this kid uh, did with his life and whether it was worth it, you know. Maybe we'll get a little comment discussion down down below, because uh, there's there's a lot to balance out on either side. Anyways, McCandless quickly became enamored of Carthage. He liked the community's stasis, its plebeian virtues, and unassuming, unassuming mien. I don't I don't know what mien. M I E N. Not sure what that means. The place was a back eddy, a pool of jetsam beyond the pull of the main current, and that suited him just fine. Back that fall, he developed a lasting bond with both the town and Westerberg. Westerberg, in his mid-thirties, was brought to Carthage as a young boy by adoptive parents. A renaissance man of the plains. He's a farmer, a welder, businessman, machinist, ace mechanic, commodity speculator, Licensed airplane pilot, computer programmer, electronics troubleshooter, video video game repairman. Shortly before he met McCandless, however, one of his talents got him in trouble with the law. Um, I guess it was a, a little scheme building uh, black boxes that scramble satellite TV. Anyways, uh, the FBI got wind of this and set up a sting and arrested him and in 1990, some weeks after McCandless uh, had been uh, working for him in Carthage, only weeks, he had to begin, uh, Westerberg, Wayne Westerberg had to begin serving a four-month sentence. Before departing, McCandless gave Westerberg a treasured 1942 edition of Tolstoy's War and Peace. On the title page, he inscribed, Transferred to Wayne Westerberg from Alexander. October 1990. Listen to Pierre. I, I don't get that reference. I've never read the book. But uh, I uh, figured I'd, I'd just mention that because it's... Most of what I highlight in this book is uh, is either what the Chris McCandless, either what he writes or how he... Uh, what he says to the people he's made acquaintances with on the road or just uh, something that portrays his um, you know his pers his general perspective on life because um, I mean ultimately the, the point of reading this book is to get inside the mind of, of somebody who at 22 fresh out of college uh, you know with a seemingly bright future ahead of them why the hell they would go on a two-year hiatus from family, friends, society for the most part, and uh, just hitchhike like a like a like like someone in poverty? I was gonna say a bum, but uh, I don't know, like someone who is uh, not from his background. We'll put it that way. Um, okay. So I got this broken up into six parts. We just got done with the first one. So, in truth, McCandless, he'd been raised in a comfortable upper middle class environs of Annandale, Virginia. His father, Walt, 
is an eminent aerospace engineer who designed advanced radar systems for the space shuttle. There were eight children in the extended family, a younger sister, Kareen, with whom Chris was extremely close, and six and a half brothers, or six half brothers, <laughs> and said, uh, <laughs> from, uh, from Walt's first marriage. In May 1990, Chris graduated from Emory University in Atlanta. The final two years of his college ed education had been paid for with a $40,000 request left by a friend of the family's. More than 24000 of it remained at the time of Chris's graduation, money his parents thought he would intend to use for law school. We misread him, his father admits. He would shortly donate all the money in his college fund to Oxfam America, a charity de dedicated to fighting hunger. Um, on Mother's Day, not too long after he uh, graduated college, Chris gave Billy, his mom, candy, flowers, a sentimental card. She was surprised and extremely touched. It was the first present she'd received from her son in more than two years since, and get this, he had announced to his parents on principle he would no longer give or accept gifts. So uh, this was, uh, you know, his graduation two years before that. Halfway, he was a sophomore in college when he decided this. He was... Uh, and yeah, actually, I, never mind, I won't get into it too much. Uh, but uh, it goes into his background in high school. Uh, he like, he was he was a very unique kid. This, uh, this behavior, this uh, mentality of his didn't just come out of the blue. So um, it's another interesting part to see it come to fruition and to see it really just manifest itself uh all this this thought thinking about others and and starvation and what's going on in other parts of the world and, and actually caring and empathizing you know like so few people do anyways uh i can't believe they try to buy me a car he says he later complained to his sister kareem what they think i'd actually let them pay for my law school or that they think i'd actually let them pay for it if i was going to go I've told them a million times, I've had, I have the best car in the world, a car that has spanned the continent from Miami to Alaska, a car that has in all those thousands of miles not given me a single problem, a car that will never trade in, a car that I'm really attached to, I'm going to have to be real careful not to accept any gifts from them in the future, because then they'll think they've bought my respect. So, I mean, you can see he's got, or he had, uh, deep-seated issues with his parents. Anyways, toward the end of June, Chris, still in Atlanta, mailed his parents a copy of his final grade report, an A in Apartheid in South African Society and History of anthrop Anthropological Thought, an A- in Contemporary African Politics and the Food Crisis in Africa. And a brief note was attached. Here's a copy of my final transcript. Grade-wise, Everything went pretty well, and I ended up with a high cumulative average. Not much else happening, but it's starting to get real hot and humid down here. Say hi to everyone for me. And that was the last anyone in Chris's family would ever hear from him. So, now we're off. Um, By the beginning of August 1990, Chris's parents... They'd heard nothing from their son since they'd received his grades and in the mail. So they decided to drive down to Atlanta for a visit. When they arrived at his apartment, it was empty, and a for-rent sign was taped to the window. Five weeks earlier, he'd loaded all his belongings into his little car and headed west without, without an itinerary. The trip was to be an odyssey in the fullest sense. An epic journey that would change everything. He had spent the previous four years, as he saw it, preparing to fulfill an absurd and onerous duty, graduating from college. At long last, he was unencumbered, emancipated from the stifling world of his parents and peers, a world of abstraction and security and material excess, a world, a world in which he felt grievously cut off from the raw throb of existence, driving west out of Atlanta. He intended to invent an utterly new life for himself, one which he would feel 
free to wallow in the unfiltered existence and experience. To symbolize the complete, complete severance from his previous life, he even adopted a new name. No longer would he answer to Chris McCandless. He was now Alexander Supertramp, master of his own destiny. Wow. This might take a couple episodes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I didn't think it would. Uh, I thought I'd be reading a lot faster. Uh. Okay, make sure I'm on track chronologically. Okay. This is a uh, from the author Paul Shepard from Man in the Landscape, a historic view of the aesthetics of nature. To the desert go prophets and hermits. Through deserts go pilgrims and exiles. Here the leaders of the great religions have sought the therapeutic and spiritual values of retreat, not to escape, but to find reality. Real quick, here is a... Uh, so, anybody who's familiar with the states can imagine uh, from Florida... To California, it's about 3,000 miles, and uh, he's on the Arizona California border, so he probably went about from Atlanta, probably about 2,500 miles. And uh, right there, you got Bullhead City, um, and there's Mexico down there. I'm trying to find the oh, I gotta zoom in a little bit. With my fancy equipment here. Right there where it says Detrito Wash. That's where he took his car off road and camped out. And this is Lake Mead up here. And uh, this is where we're at now. He just left college. Um, or he just left his, uh, his apartment, packed everything up. And uh, loaded minimal things in his car and took off on a journey without discretion of where the hell he's going so this chapter is called to treat a wash there we are so in the Mojave two days after McCandless set up camp besides Lake Mead an unusually robust wall of thunderheads reared up in the afternoon sky it began to rain really hard over much of the Jatridal Valley. McCandless, he was camped at the edge of the wash, a couple of feet higher than the main channel. So when the bore of brown water came rushing down from the high country, he had just enough time to gather his tent and belongings and save them from being swept away. If he hoped to get the car back to the paved road... McCainless had no choice but to walk out and notify authorities of his predicament. McCainless could endeavor to explain that he had answered that he answered to statutes of a higher order because because uh, he wasn't supposed to the road he was on was specifically had a sign telling uh, travelers with cars not to drive on it and uh, so he would have obviously uh, to get his car out he would have had to answer. To why the hell he or why he uh, he chose to rebel? Anyways, uh, McCandless could endeavor to explain that he answered to statutes of a higher order, statutes of a higher order, and that as latter day as latter day adherent of Henry David Thoreau, he took as gospel the essay on civil duty, on the duty of civil disobedience. Excuse me. And, uh, and thus considered it his moral responsibility to flout the laws of the state. <laughs> At, that's actually uh, one of my books there. I need to read that. It was improbable, however, that deputies of the federal government would share his point of view. Instead of feeling distraught over this turn of events, moreover, McCandless 
He was exhilarated. He saw the flash flood as an opportunity to shed unnecessary baggage. He arranged all his paper currency in a pile of sand on a, a pathetic little stack of ones, fives, and twenties and put a match to it. We know all this, um, reading the book, he, the author, uh, tells us we know all this because McCandless documented the burning of his own money and most of the events that followed in a journal snapshot album. And, uh, yeah, interestingly, he, uh, his, his journal was in the third person. It, it's been quoted as melodramatic third person, like, uh, well, you'll have excerpts of it. Instead of I did this, it was he did this, and it was it, it's kind of interesting how he did that. They don't really get to why he would do that, but uh, I think he was uh, obviously he was an intelligent kid. And writing, uh, he wasn't he wasn't foreign to writing, so maybe maybe he read a book about that or something that maybe he was copying someone. Anyways, the, the available evidence, uh, evidence according to John Krakauer, the author, indicates that McCandless didn't misrepresent the facts, and telling the truth was a credo he took seriously. So, McCandless set out on July 10th, 1990, to hike around Lake Mead, and this, his journal acknowledges, turned out to be a tremendous mistake. In extreme July, temperatures become delirious, suffering from a heat stroke. He managed to flag down some passing boaters, who gave him a lift to Calville Bay, a marina near the west end of the lake, where he stuck out his thumb and took to the road. So, uh, yeah, so I guess, I guess, I guess it was about a month that he was in his car, kind of scooting around. Because it wasn't like he drove right out there and then dumped his car. He, uh, and he, he obviously didn't mean to dump his car. Um, it just happened, and he kind of went with it. So that's that's pretty interesting uh, perspective there, well, outlook on life. And uh, and yeah, his within the first couple of days of, of leaving his car, he gets a heat stroke. So he's not the most. Uh, he was a track athlete. He was like a star in high school. So he's real well physically capable, but uh, not mentally. Um, uh, I was going to say aware he he just not knowledgeable on how to survive in the wild at, at this point at least so it says now McCainless tramped around the west for the next two months spellbound by the scale and power of the landscape thrilled by minor brushes with the law savoring the intermittent company of other vagabonds he met along the way Allowing his life to be shaped by circumstance, he hitched to Lake Tahoe, hiked in the si into the Sierra Nevada, and spent a week walking north on the Pacific Crest Trail before exiting the mountains and returning to the pavement. To me, that seems like it'd be fun. The uh, the big forests of Northern California, I, I think that's where it is. That uh, it sounds like a blast. But... Uh, but yeah, I was just about to say, maybe I was, obviously I read this more than once here, and it's a little subconscious guy in me. I was about to say, unless, except for the, the nutballs you uh, you meet along the way, I'm sure. And, uh, and here it says, at the end of July, he accepted a ride from a man who called himself Crazy Ernie and offered McCandless a job at a ranch in Northern California. Photographs of the place show an unpainted, tumbled-down house surrounded by goats and chickens, bed springs, broken TVs, shop carts, um, old appliances, and a bunch of garbage. After working there 11 days with six other vagabonds, it became clear to McCandless that Ernie had no intentions of ever paying him, so he stole a red bike and uh, from the clutter in the yard and pedaled into Chico and ditched the bike in a mall parking lot. Then he resumed a life of constant motion. So, 60 miles south of the Oregon line border near the town of Oric, a pair of drifters in an old van pulled over to their to consult their map when they noticed a boy crouching in the brushes off the side of the road um, this couple is uh, the 
one of the main uh, friends he gets acquainted with in the book, in the movie, and in real life. And uh, in the book, their names are, uh, well, I mean, in real life, their, their names are uh, Jan and, and Bob. And for some reason, they uh, they change Bob's name to Rainy in, in the movie. I'm not sure why, but whatever. So, uh, anyways, anyone who's seen the movie, this is the, that couple that he uh, he hangs out with, the hippie couple with the van. Um, so, anyway, she says, we got to talking. He was a nice kid, and he said his name was Alex. He was big time hungry, 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 but real happy. Said he'd been surviving on edible plants he identified from the book like he was real proud of it. Uh, said he was tramping around the country, having a big old adventure. He told us about abandoning his car, about burning all his money. I said, why would you do that? He claimed he didn't need money. We, uh, we thought the world of him, she says. For the next two years, Alex sent us a postcard every month or two. Uh, and on August 10th, 1990, shortly before meeting Jan Burris and Bob, McCandless had been ticketed for hitchhacking. Um, and it said in an uncharacteristic lapse, he gave his parents actual Annandale, uh, Annandale, Virginia address when the arresting officer demanded to know his permanent place of residence. And, uh, and sure enough, the unpaid ticket appeared in his parents' mailbox at the end of August. So his parents, Walt and Billy, Billy's the mother, terribly concerned over Chris's uh, Chris's uh, vanishing act, had by that time already contacted the Annandale police, who had been of no help. When the ticket arrived from California, they'd been frantic. Uh, they became frantic. One of their neighbors was actually the director of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, and Walt approached this man, an Army general, for advice. The general put him in touch with a private investigator named Peter Kalitka, who'd done contract work for the CIA. He was best. He was the best, apparently. The general assured Walt, if uh, if Chris was out there, this guy would find him. And uh, they don't really talk about this guy too much more. So, spoiler alert, he never found him. And apparently he went to, I don't know if I actually have uh, have it to where I'll read it, but he uh, this guy went to like South Africa and Europe, I think. And still never found this, uh, this kid who was just hanging around the States the whole time. Not that the States are small, but anyways, he's supposed to be good. And he didn't find him. Uh, so as uh, as this P.I. Kalitka was trying to pick up Chris's scent in California, McCandless was already far away, hitching the rest of the Cascade Range across the sagebrush uh, uplands and lava beds of the Columbia River Basin, across the Idaho Panhandle into Montana, and there outside Cut Bank, uh, Cut Bank, Montana, I believe, he crossed paths with Wayne Westerberg. By the end of September, he was working for him in Carthage. And I'm going to do my time. Okay. I mean, believe it or not, I've only read, read, written, read that much. Uh, but uh, like 50 pages of this book, this guy talks about himself and some other guys that do similar things like Chris so um, to tackle just Chris's story it's a uh, we can like shave like, like that much off I'm sorry so anyway it's not it's not that long of a book all in all um, all right before I hit the hour mark let's let's finish up this chapter and uh, maybe I'll start a new one probably start a new beer too uh, so um, we're still in 1990 here, same year he graduated. In uh, October 28th, he got a ride with a long-haul trucker into Needles, California. And overjoyed upon reaching the Colorado River, he says in his journal. Then he left the highway and started walking south through the desert, following the riverbank 12 miles on foot. 
and he noticed a uh, in uh, Topic, Arizona, a city or Topak, he noticed a second hand second hand aluminum canoe for sale, and on an impulse decided to buy it and paddle down the Colorado River to the Gulf of California, nearly 400 miles to the south. That's that's quite an impulse. Um, and he had to go across the Mexican border here. So uh, McCandless was McCandless was stirred by the austerity, which means harsh, unfriendly, or ascetic um, of this landscape by its saline beauty. The desert sharpened the sweet ache of his longing, amplified it. And at the end of November, he paddled through Yuma where he stopped long enough to replenish his provisions and sent a postcard to Westberg, who was still in, uh, in prison at the time. Uh, yeah, okay, so here's an example of uh, how he writes. Hey, Wayne, how's it going? I hope that your situation has improved since the last time we spoke. I've been tramping around Arizona for about a month now. This is a good state. There's all kinds of fantastic scenery, and the climate is wonderful. But apart from sending greetings, and the main purpose, uh, the main purpose of, of this card is to thank you once again for all your hospitality. It's rare to find a man as generous and good-natured as you are. Sometimes I wish I hadn't met you, though. Tramping is too easy with all this money. My days were more exciting when I was pen penniless and had to forage around for my next meal. I couldn't make it now without money, however as there is very little fruit fruiting agriculture down here at this time. Please thank Kevin for all the clothes he gave me. I would I would have froze to death without them. I hope he got I hope he got that book to you. Wayne, you should really read War and Peace. I meant it when I said you had one of the highest characters of any man I'd met. That is a, a very powerful and highly symbolic book. It has things in it that I think you will understand things that escape most people as for me I've decided I'm going to live this life for some time to come the freedom and simple beauty of it is just too good to pass up one day I'll get back to you Wayne and repay you for some of your kindness a case of Jack Daniels maybe until then I'll uh, I'll always think of you as a friend God bless you Alexander On December 2nd, 1990, he reached the Morelos Dam in Mexican border. Worried that he would be denied entry because he was carrying no ID, he sneaked into Mexico by paddling through the dam's open floodgates and shooting the spillway below. Alex, this is what he writes, this is how he writes in his journal here. Alex looks quickly around for signs of trouble, but his entry of Mexico is either unnoticed or ignored. Alexander is jubilant exclamation point his jubilance however was short lived below the Morelos Dam the river turns into a maze of irrigation canals marshland and dead end channels among which McCainless repeatedly lost his way and, uh, and he has a lot to write in his journal here um, I wasn't going to read it but it is like I said. It's interesting to hear. The the little we have firsthand is uh, is I think worth reading. He says uh, canals break. This, this is him writing in his journal. Canals break off in a multitude of directions. Alex is dumbfounded. Encounters some canal officials who can speak a little English. They tell him he hasn't been traveling south but west and is headed for the center of the Baja Peninsula. Alex is crushed leads and persists that there must be some way to the waterway some waterway to the gulf of california they stare at alex and think him crazy but then a passionate conversation breaks out amongst them accompanied by maps and the flourish of pencils after 10 minutes they present to alex a route which apparently will take him to the ocean he's overjoyed and hope bursts back into his heart
Hey everybody, thanks again for joining me for Into the Wild. This is episode 2 of this pretty awesome book. Um, last time I left you, we, our protagonist, Chris McCainless, was making his way down to Mexico on a canoe. Yeah, that was quite a cliffhanger. Um, and I apologize for the abrupt ending, too. It, uh, my program I use here doesn't let me record for more than an hour, which I, I, I know, uh, me personally, I enjoy the really long ASMR videos. So, I will I'll attempt to give you close to an hour every time I make a video. And, um... Yeah, I'm still kind of working out the kinks with my fancy new microphone. I know that my first episode of this book here was, uh, it was a little loud and a little fast-paced. Um, hopefully it was still relaxing, but, uh, that, that wasn't quite what I was going for. Um, it was, you know, a little, a little too non-ASMR. I want to, um, I want to try this actually... If you see my my video showing the three micro microphones I was comparing, you know that this beautiful microphone here has four different settings, uh, polar patterns, I guess they're called. And uh, last time I was using the stereo, so it got kind of direct, and then the left and right sounds. Um, this time I'm going to try the bi-directional, which means it's going to pick up in my, it's going to pick up directly from my voice right in front of me in the back of the microphone as well, not on the sides. So you might hear my computer fan a little bit more, but hopefully it'll, uh, it'll be better for things like page turning and, you know, when I'm kind of uh, brushing the pages and maybe tapping and flipping along like, like so. Um, we'll see. Kind of trial by error, but I'll get it to work out. Um, before I get back into our reading and discussing, because I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to just purely read, I actually just finished the, it's really an autobiography by his sister called, um, into the wild here, or, or <laughs> sorry, the wild truth, rather, the secrets that drove Chris McCandless into the wild by his sister, Kareen McCandless. She, uh, she basically tells you a little more personal story of their, their upbringing, which was pretty violent, actually, and uh, emotionally, and sometimes physically abusive. But, um, there's a, personally, unless you're, unless you're really, you know, want compelled to, to know, um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, honestly, um, because Into the Wild itself, uh, it was just beautifully written, and it spoke to, uh, a wider audience, this is more, I believe that was more, you know, Into the Wild was more philosophical. Whereas this book, like I said, it's more of an autobiography of his sister. But, um, you know, I mean, I don't know, I feel like in a way she's sort of capitalizing on her, her brother's death. Um, because... Wow, there was, it was well written, um, there were certainly some interesting anecdotes from her, it wasn't worth, what was it, 260 some odd pages, yeah, something like that, yeah, I kind of read it fast because it got boring, but, uh, you know, it, uh, it certainly gave you a little more insight into why 
why this kid left like he did. Um, his dad, his dad, uh, while he was married and had six children with another family, he was having an affair, an affair with uh, Chris McCandless and his sister's mom. So, and, and uh, Chris, the, um, the protagonist of Into the Wild, he was actually born, um, he was actually born after, or no, sorry, he was born before being an illegitimate child, technically a bastard, I guess. He was born before the last child of his dad's first wife. Um, so basically it gives you an idea of the moral environment he was raised in him his dad um, apparently always lied about that too um, he tried to fudge their ages and act like he stopped having um, you know relations with his his first wife before um, he had children. He had Chris and Corrine with, uh, with Billy, as she's called. Um, Chris's, Chris's mom. Um, and anyways, it was basically just, uh, it was a really mentally unstable guy from the sounds of it. His dad was. Here's a, here's a quick picture of his parents. Walt and Billy McCandless, and um, there's a few pictures in here. If you guys are interested, I'm sure you can find them online. Um, I want to show you one of uh, or a couple of, of Chris, because obviously he's the focus of of this. So here's yeah, here's a few, and you can just tell he. Uh, he didn't, he didn't tend, tend to smile. There's one of him with his buddy. This is, what if I got my, I don't know, where's my finger at? No, sorry, <laughs> I'm on the wrong page. This is him right here. And you can see he's, he's got kind of a, just kind of a smirk where his buddy's got a full-blown smile. Um, here's him at junior prom or something like that with uh, his his girlfriend who ended up leaving him I guess because he, he took the relationship um, too seriously as a young kid which I can personally relate to um, you know that that young youthful idealism of, of what a relationship ought to be compared to what it is and this is him he has it says right there when he began asking questions about his family and why he had all these these other children always visiting him but he wasn't really he didn't know whether to call them his brothers and sisters or not because his dad apparently there's one of them at the beach his dad was apparently uh, like I said eh, um, pretty self deluded and uh, didn't never wanted to admit that he was having an affair while he was still married to his other wife and uh, last but not least here's a family portrait and that kind of speaks volumes about the family dynamics and Chris uh, Chris is the older sibling and right there that's the famous scene from Into the Wild, or one of many. Uh, what am I doing? <laughs> Sorry. Where, um, where he was eating dinner before, uh, right after he graduated, and he uh, he was showing his sister uh, around Atlanta in the Dotson, and he shows up for dinner. And uh, I believe that was one of the last dinners they ever saw him at. Or the last times they ever got, got together with him. So, um, alright. So, it's going on ten minutes already. I apologize, guys. I'll, uh, we'll get started now. I have a link for those of you who don't care about that. Okay, like I said, he, um, 
here a little timeline well, I'm, I keep glancing at that uh, essentially gives us uh, some chronology he he graduates in okay the spring of 1990 and then as soon as he graduates he he takes off in his car um, and abandons it in Arizona about the summertime um, and then he goes hikes hikes all up around Northern California and uh, meets a couple rubber tramps as they're called which are basically uh, vagabonds who who have a car and um, he gets a ride and, and, and develops a, a lasting relationship with them and, uh, and now in the winter obviously it's getting cold in, in most parts of America at this point so Chris is, uh, he's compelled to go down south for winter, and he gets a canoe. He buys a canoe with, uh, I guess, some money he had earned at a job or something like that. And literally uh, canoes down most of uh, a 400-mile trip from, uh, from around, um, or down the Colorado River, I think it is. And that goes into Mexico. So um, now he's we're at we're at the uh, the beginning of December 1990. This is basically almost about eight months of him just trekking around the states here. And he um, he is uh, recording his events in a journal. So he says after he uh, went through the gate. And again, I mentioned this last time, it's very interesting that he was recording in the third person in his journal. So that's why it sounds kind of odd, but um, he says, Alex looks quickly around as he's crossing the border for signs of trouble. But his entry of Mexico is either unnoticed or ignored. Alexander is jubilant. His jubilance, however, was short-lived. Below the dam, the Morelos Dam, the river turns into a maze of irrigation canals, marshlands, and dead-end channels, along which McCandless repeatedly lost his way. And um, then he says, he continues, a reconnaissance mission reveals, however, that Alex has merely run back into the bed of the now dead and dry Colorado River. He discovers another canal about half a mile on the other side and decides to portage to this canal. It takes him three days to carry the canoe. And he says, local inhabitants help him, and this is still his journal, help him portage around a barrier. Alex finds Mexicans to be warm, friendly people, much more hospitable than Americans. Um, and December 9th, his journal reads, all hopes collapse. The canal does not reach the ocean, but merely peters out into a vast swamp. Alex is utterly confounded. He decides he must be close to the ocean and elects to try and find work, a way to work his way through the swamp. Alex becomes progressively lost to a point where he must push canoe through reeds and drag it through mud. All is despair. He's kind of dramatic, you know, um, but you could tell he was uh, somewhat of an English major, you know, uh, I think he was a sociology major or something, but no doubt he has some experience in writing up. Finds, uh, finds some dry ground to camp and swamp at sundown. Next day on 1210, Alex resumes his quest for an opening to the sea but only becomes more confused traveling in circles. Completely demoralized and frustrated, he lays his canoe down and, and, and uh, sleeps in it at the day's end and weeps. But then, by fantastic chance, he comes upon Mexican duck hunting guides who can speak English. He tells them his story and his quest for the sea. They say there's no outlet. But then, one among the, them agrees to allow Alex back to his base camp. 
or excuse me, to tow Alex back to his base camp behind a small motor skiff and drive him and the canoe in the bed of a pickup truck to the ocean. It's a miracle, he says. Um, so a couple days later, on December 14th, he hauled the canoe far up the beach and he had made it to the ocean by this point, climbed a sandstone bluff and set up camp on a large desolate plateau. He stayed there for 10 days. His journal entry for January 11th, 91, this is a, you know, nearly a month later. Um, a very fateful day. Wind and tidal rips conspired to carry him out to sea. The water by this time was a chaos of white caps that threatened to swamp and capsize his tiny craft. In great frustration, the journal reads, he screams and beats canoe with oar. The oar breaks. Alex has one spare oar, and he calms himself. If loses second oar is dead. Finally, through extreme effort and much cursing, he manages the beach canoe, a uh, beach canoe on jetty and collapses exhausted on sand at sundown. This incident led Alexander to decide to abandon canoe and return north. And mind you, he says he couldn't swim. So this is, this is crazy what he's doing. It's pretty wild. Uh, January 16th. McCandless left the stubby metal boat on the hummock of dune grass southeast of El Golfo de Santa Clara and started walking north up the deserted beach. So he says he, um, he hadn't talked to anybody for 36 days. For that entire period, he ate nothing except off of a five pound bag of rice and what marine life he could pull from the sea. I, I think he had a fishing pole and um, an experience that would later convince him he could survive on similarly meager rations in the Alaska bush. Now, on January 18th, he was caught by immigration authorities trying to slip into the country without ID. He spent the night in custody before concocting a story that sprang him from the slammer minus his 38 caliber handgun. It says McCandless spent the next six weeks on the move across the southwest, traveling as far east as Houston and as far west as the Pacific coast to avoid being rolled by the unsavory characters who ruled the streets and freeway overpasses where he slept, he learned to bury what money he had before entering the city, then recover it on the way out of town. On February 3rd, 91 now, according to his journal, McCainless went to Los Angeles to get an ID and job, but feels extremely uncomfortable in society now and must return to the road immediately, he says. Okay. Um, let me make sure I'm on track. Six days later, oh sorry, Alexander buried his backpack in the des in the desert on uh, February 27th and enters Las Vegas with no money and no ID. There it says he lived on the streets with bums, tramps, and winos for several weeks. Vegas would not be the end of the story, however. He's writing this in his journal now. On May 10th, itchy feet returned and Alex left his job in Vegas retrieved his backpack and hit the road again. It is the experiences, he says, the memories, the great triumph and joy of living to the fullest extent in which real meaning is found.
God, it's great to be alive. Thank you, thank you. Now here's a quote. Um, the dominant primordial beast was strong in Buck, and under the fierce conditions of trail life it grew and grew. It was a secret growth. His newborn cunning gave him poise and control. A quote highlighted from Jack, uh, Jack London's Call of the Wild um, by McCandless in his book. And, uh, and uh, inside the abandoned bus where he was found dead, uh, it was saw that he, it was seen that he wrote, All hail the dominant primordial beast. And Captain Ahab too, Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. I don't know if he was trying to make a little rhyme or something. Um, okay, so in September of '91, this is about it's about a year and a half uh, after he left. So we just went, uh, we took a pretty big gap there. Um, I think he was in Vegas, uh, you know, sometime around spring of '91, and apparently. He had been taking a photo journal. Uh, you know, he had a he had a camera as well as his written journal. That the the writer of this book, um, John John Krakauer, uh, used to, to track his movements and then plot his his course of uh, over the two years before he actually took off into the Alaskan wilderness. And that's why he has a pretty big gap now. We go from like March, April, May ish to September of '91 because he actually buried his camera in the ground and uh, wrote in his journal that that uh, that the camera got ruined, basically in a nutshell. So we don't really, uh, nobody really knows what he was doing for the whole summer. Uh, It says, except for a letter uh, sent to Jan Burris, Jan and Bob being the rubber tramps that, that he met with um, and got to know. He always sent them letters occasionally. We know he spent July and August on the Oregon coast, probably in the vicinity of Astoria, where he complained that fog and rain was often intolerable. In September now, he, he hitched down to the U.S. Highway 101 into California then headed east into the desert again and by early October he landed in Bullhead City, Arizona so when he arrived in Bullhead City McCandless stopped moving for more than two months probably the longest he stayed in one place since the time he left uh, Atlanta until he went to the Stampede Trail obviously um, in a card no, he was holding down, uh, this is an interesting part, he was holding down a full-time job flipping quarter pounders at McDonald's on the main drag in Bullhead City, Arizona, and commuting to work on a bicycle. Outwardly, he was living a surprisingly conventional existence, even going so far as to opening a savings account at a local bank. When McCandless applied for the McDonald's job, he presented himself as Chris McCandless, not Alex, and gave his employer, employers his real social security number. It was uncharacteristic for him uh, to break from his cover like that, and it might have easily have alerted his parents, his parents to his whereabouts, although the lapse proved to be of no consequence because the private investor, investigator they hired, his parents hired, never caught the slip. Um, talking to one of the people he actually worked with um, at McDonald's, they said, uh, they said, I don't think he ever hung out with any of the employees after work or anything. When he talked, he was, he was always going on about trees and nature and weird stuff like that, she says. We all thought he was missing a few screws. Okay. 
Hey, now, um, yeah, and like, like he said, he was living in Bullhead for a while, so he was, you know, he was just trying to earn some money, I guess, um, before he moved on, as, as Jan and her boyfriend Bob, the rubber tramps, were preparing to drive up for the visit, uh, Jan Burris returned to the campsite one evening, evening to find a big backpack leaning against our vans. She recognized it immediately as Alex's. McCandless explained to Burris that he'd grown tired of Bullhead, tired of punching a clock, tired of the plastic people he worked with, and decided to get the hell out of town. Uh, Jan and Bob were staying three miles outside of Nyland at a place called the Slabs. Slab City of, uh, an old na Navy air base that had been abandoned and raised leaving a grid of empty concrete foundations scattered far and wide across the desert. Um, again, you know, it's hard not to keep referencing the movie for visualizations of these because the uh, the director, Sean Penn, took them out to a shot in on-location mode for most of the scenes. Um, definitely that one. He actually went out to Slab City and, and shot there. And uh, then it says McCandless um, out there. I guess uh, she was she was just selling knickknacks and used books and things like that. So he volunteered to oversee her large inventory of used paperback books. He helped me a lot. She says he watched the table when I needed to leave. Categorized all the books. Made a lot of sales. He seemed to get a real kick out of it. Alex was big on the classics: Dickens, H.G. Wells, Mark Twain. Jack London. London was his favorite. He'd try to convince every snowbird who walked by that they should read Call of the Wild. There's a little side note about Jack London. McCandless conveniently overlooked the fact that London himself had spent just a single winter in the north and he died by his own hand on his California estate at the age of 40. A fatuous drunk, obese, empathetic, maintaining a sedentary existence that bore scant resemblance to the ideals he espoused in print. Which I never knew. I don't think I've ever read Jack London. But it was interesting, because um, I wonder if McCandless actually did know that. Anyways, he had a good time when he was around people. Burris, uh, Jan Burris is now saying again, a real good time at the swap meet. He'd talk and talk to everybody who came by. He must have met six or seven dozen people in Nyland, and he was friendly with every one of them. He decided um, he needed solitude at times, but he wasn't a hermit. He did a lot of socializing. Sometimes I think it was like he was storing up company for the times when he knew nobody would be around. And uh, finally, after a little, a little stay with her, he accepted Burris' offer to drive him to uh, back to Salton City, where he was getting his Bullhead City paychecks delivered. And uh, anyways, he acted real offended when she tried to give him some things. And I told him, man, you got to have money to get along in the world. But he wouldn't take it. Finally, I got him to take some Swiss Army knives and a few belt knives. And eventually, he took it to shut me up, he says. But the day after he left, I found most of it in the back of the van. Now, here's a uh, excerpt from Henry David Thoreau and from Walden. A passage highlighted in one of the books found with Chris McCandless's remains. If the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy, and life emits a fragrant fragrance like flowers and sweet scented herbs, it is more elastic, more starry, more immortal. That is your success. All nature is your congratulation, and you have cause momentarily to bless yourself. The greatest gains and values are the farthest from being appreciated. We easily come to doubt if they exist. We soon forget them. They are the highest reality. 
The true harvest of my daily life is somewhat as intangible and indescribable as the tints of morning or evening. It's a stardust caught, a segment of the rainbow which I have clutched. So after McCandless bid farewell to Jan Burris at the Salton City Post Office, he hiked into the desert and set up camp in a break of creosote at the edge of the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. Hard to the east is the Salton Sea, a placid ocean in miniature. When he needed provisions, he would hitch or walk the four miles into town. And then in mid-January, this is... Um, this is actually 1992 now, so you can see we're, we're close to him actually going into the wild in Alaska. In mid-January, he was hiking back out and he met, he met Ron Franz, an old man who stopped to give him a ride. When he returned to McCandless camp, and launched into a self-improvement pitch, McCandless cut him off abruptly. Look, Mr. Franz, you don't need to worry about me. I have a college education. I'm not destitute. I'm living like this by choice. Over the next few weeks, McCandless spent a lot of time together with Franz, though. On March 5th, 1992, McCandless sent another card to Burris and a card to France as well. To the missive to, to Burris, I guess missive is message or something, um, says, uh, greetings from Seattle. I'm a hobo now, that's right. I'm riding the rails. What fun. I wish I had jumped trains earlier. The rails have been some, have had some drawbacks, however. First, is that one becomes absolutely filthy. Second, is that one must tangle with these crazy bulls. I was sitting in a hot shot in LA when a bull found me with his flashlight about 10 p.m. Get out of here before I kill you, he screamed. I got out and he saw, I saw that he had drawn his revolver. He interrogated me at gunpoint and growled. If I ever see you around this train again, I'll kill you. Hit the road. What a lunatic. I got the last laugh when I caught the same train five minutes later and rode it all the way to Oakland. That must have been pretty exciting, actually. Unable to find work in the rainy northwest, McCandless hopped a series of freight trains back to the desert. In Colton, California, he was discovered by another bull and actually thrown in jail. And actually, uh, he phoned um, Ronald Franz again, and, and uh, that, that guy came out and picked him up there. And McCandless said he'd be st staying only a day, just, just long enough to wash his clothes and load his backpack. He'd heard from Wayne Westerberg that a job was waiting for him at the grain elevator in Carthage, and he was eager to get there. And then... So he gets a ride out, like almost a day and a half worth of driving from this guy France to go up to South Dakota from the uh, from the Southwest. And when they're about to um, about to part ways, France uh, France says, "My mother was an only child." He explains, "So was my father, and I was their only child. Now that my own boys are dead, I'm the end of the line." When I'm gone, my family will be finished, gone forever. So I asked Alex if I could adopt him, if he would be my grandson. McCainless, uncomfortable with the request, dodged the question. We'll talk about it when I get back from Alaska, Ron. He'd successfully kept Jan Burris and Wayne Westerberg at arm's length, flitting out their lives before anything flitting out of their lives before anything was expected of him, and now he'd slipped painlessly out of Ron Franz's life as well. 
Now this is an especially this is an especially poignant um, letter from Alex or Chris McCamus to um, Ronald Franz, the older guy who he uh, he became friends with. And, and I'm just uh, reading the the highlighted parts. I think are are particularly important or, or hit home for me. Um, he says, I think you really should make a radical change in your lifestyle and begin to boldly do things which you may have previously never thought of doing or been too hesitant to attempt. So many people live with unhappy circumstances and yet will not take the initiative to change their situation because they're conditioned to a life of security, conformity, and conservatism, all of which may appear to give one peace of mind. But in reality, nothing is more damaging to the adventurous spirit within a man, or woman obviously, than a secure future, he says. The very, the very basic core of a man's living spirit is his passion for adventure. The joy of life comes from our encounters with new experiences, and hence there is no greater joy than to have an endlessly changing horizon, for each day to have a new and different sun. If you want to get more out of life, Ron, you must lose your inclination for monotonous security and adopt a helter-skelter style of life that will first appear to you to be crazy, but once you become accustomed to such a life, you will see its full meaning and its incredible beauty. Don't settle down and sit in one place, move around, be nomadic. Make each day a new horizon. You're still going to live a long time, Ron. It would be a shame if you didn't take the opportunity to revolutionize your life and move into an entirely new realm of experience. You're wrong if you think joy emanates only or principally from human relationships. God has placed it all around us. Ron, I really hope that as soon as you can you'll get out of Salton City. Put a little camper on the back of your pickup and start seeing some of the great work that God has done here in the American West. You notice he, I don't, I don't think he was um, brought up in a, in a extremely devout Christian family. Excuse me, but um, but he certainly references God a lot. So it's interesting how religious he was, um, or what type of, you know relationship with with whatever god he believed in he actually had um it's still pretty ambiguous even throughout the whole book anyways he said you'll see things and meet people and there's much to learn from them and you must do it economy style no motels do your own cooking as a general rule spend as little as possible and you'll enjoy it much more immensely I hope that the next time I see you, you'll be a new man with a vast array of new adventures and experiences behind you. Don't hesitate or allow yourself to make excuses. Just get out and do it. Just get out and do it. You'll be very, very glad you did. Take care, Ron and Alex. It says, astoundingly, the 81-year-old man took the brash 24-year-old vagabond's advice. He took it to heart and France places for furniture and most of his other possessions in storage locker, bought a GMC Duravan and outfitted it with bunks and camping gear, and moved out of his apartment, and he set up camp on the Bajada. Franz occupied McCandless's old campsite. Just past the hot springs, he arranged some rocks to create a little parking area for his van and transplanted some prickly pears and indigo brushes for landscaping and then sat out in the desert day after day waiting for his friend's return. So it's like he kind of jumped on it, but then uh, I think he ended up just staying in that one spot. So he's not like he really made too much of a change. Okay, 
so now here's uh, here's that man Wayne Westerberg played by Vince Vaughn in the movie this is uh, going to give you some insight into what it was like being out there with him or rather um, his Wayne's um, perspective on Alex after working with him and hiring him um Again, I, I love how each chapter starts off with a little quote from a book. Um, some are highlighted from a canvas. Some are actually just personal picks uh, by the author himself. So, um, this one in particular is by the author Anthony Storr in the book Solitude, A Return to the Self. Um, and real quick, it's, it's true that many creative people fail to make more mature personal relationships and some are extremely isolated it's also true that some and that in some uh, instances trauma in the shape of early separation or, or bereavement has steered the potentially creative person towards developing aspects of his personality which can find fulfillment in comparative isolation but this does not mean that solitary, creative pursuits are themselves pathological. Or uh, uh, an actual, like a disease, you know, physical, mental disease. Um, soon after McCainless returned to Carthage that spring, Westerberg introduced him to his longtime on again, off again girlfriend, Gail Burra. Alex talked a lot when we got together, Burra recalls. Serious stuff, like he was bearing his soul, kind of. He said he could tell me things that he couldn't tell others. He could tell something was gnawing at him. Shortly before he disappeared, Chris complained to Corrine, his sister, that their parents' behavior was so irrational, so oppressive, disrespectful, and insulting that I finally passed my breaking point. He went on. Uh, this is verbatim from a note to Corrine. Since they won't ever take me seriously, for a few months after graduation, I'm going to let them think they're right. I'm going to let them think that I'm coming around to see their side of things and that our relationship is stabilizing, and then once the time is right, with one abrupt, swift action, I'm going to completely knock them out of my life. I'm going to divorce them as my parents once and for all, and never speak to either of those idiots again as long as I live. I'll be through with them once and for all, forever. The chill Westerberg sensed between his parents and Alex stood in marked contrast to the warmth that McCandless exhibited in Carthage, outgoing and extremely personable when the spirit moved him. He charmed a lot of folks. I don't recollect Alex ever talked about any girlfriend, says Westerberg, although a couple of times he mentioned wanting to get married and having a family one day. You could tell he didn't take relationships lightly. He wasn't the kind of guy who would go out and pick up girls just to get laid, you know? His sister, Corrine, recalls one instance when he got drunk and tried to bring a girl to his bedroom in the middle of the night and made so much noise stumbling up the stairs that Billy, his, his mom, woke up and sent the girl home. But there's little evidence he was uh, sexually active as a teenager and even less to suggest he slept with any woman after graduating high school. Nor, for that matter, is there any evidence he was ever sexually intimate with a man. Seems McCainless was drawn to women, but remained largely or entirely celibate, as chaste as a monk. We Americans are titillated by sex, obsessed by it, horrified by it, when a, an apparently healthy person, especially a healthy young man, elects to forgo the enticements of the flesh. It shocks us, and we leer. Suspicious suspicions are aroused. McCainless may have been tempted by the succor offered by women, but it paled beside the prospect of rough congress with nature, with the cosmos itself, 
and thus he was drawn north to Alaska. Two nights before McCandless was scheduled to head north, Mary Westerberg, Wayne's mother, either, but I kept bugging her, telling her, telling her, you gotta meet this kid. And so she finally had him over for supper, and they hit it off immediately. The two of them talked non-stop for five hours. There was something fascinating about him, explains Mrs. Westerberg. Seated at the polished walnut table where McCandless had dined, Alex struck me as much older than 24, everything I'd said. He demanded to know more about what I meant, about why I thought this way or that. He was hungry to learn about things. Unlike most of us, he was the sort of person who insisted on living out his beliefs. To everyone's surprise, McCandless sat down at the piano one night in Carthage there, and uh, what she never mentioned, he knew how to play and started pounding out honky-tonk country tunes, then rag time, then Tony Bennett numbers. He wasn't merely a drunk of inflicting his delusions of talent on a captive audience. Alex says Gail Burrow could really play. I meant he was good. We were all blown away by it, she says. And here's another uh, letter, or a couple of letters from Alex to... Uh, to um, first Westerberg and then and then Jan Burris and Bob. So the one to Westerberg goes. This was in April of uh, late April of 1992. He was uh, just about to go up into Alaska. This is the last you shall hear of me, Wayne. Arrived here two days ago from Fairbanks. It was very difficult to catch rides in the Yukon Territory, but I finally got here. Please return all mail I received to the sender. It might be a very long time before I return south. This adventure proves fatal, and you don't ever hear from me again. I want you to know that you're a great man. I now walk into the wild. Signed, Alex. And uh, on the same date, he, he writes a letter to Jan Burris and Bob, her boyfriend, Hey guys, this is the last communication you shall receive from me. I now walk to live amongst the wild. Take care. It was great knowing you. There's uh, definitely some finality to those letters, you know. It's really interesting. What page was that? 70. relevant um, 
topic to his childhood. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll find out how he was raised and, and how he ended his life. Um, you know, indirectly. Uh, next time. All right, see you then. Okay, we are back with episode three. I think it's going to be the final episode. And I'm doing a back-to-back -to -back today, so don't think I'm always wearing this shirt, even though I would if I, if I could somehow manage to keep it clean enough. Um, we're going to start. Oh, I'll try to not have too long of an intro here. I just want to briefly tell you we will start with... Um, his childhood, like I said at the end of the last video, which hopefully you didn't see, because hopefully you're asleep by the end of it, <laughs> but uh, we we need to have an understanding of his con uh, the context of his upbringing, obviously, because I'm, I personally think that, um, and I believe in nurture over nature, in that whole battle is the most influential thing on your actions and your decisions and choices and reaction to experiences in life and um, this book does a pretty pretty good job of explaining that uh, his motivations Chris McCandless's motivations to basically step the hell out of his parents lives which, um, you know, I hope if, if I'm ever, uh, if I ever get to be a parent, I hope, I'm, you know, I'm, that's the exact opposite of what most parents go for, obviously, but, uh, his parents really sounded like they, they had no, um, no understanding or no willingness to want to understand their, what's going on in their kids' heads, uh, they just kind of seemed very... Uh, like they're running a little, a little dictatorship or something, if you will. And uh, and then, yeah, basically we're going to jump from his childhood to his, his uh, you know, the crux of this whole book. His, his experience, his three months that he lived in um, the Alaska, Alaskan brush. So, uh, so st start off, it says... Uh, page yeah I, I, maybe I should have called out the pages as I was reading them to you guys I don't know whatever I'm, 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 a, I'm hoping you guys enjoy the story more than anything Chris Deferred Johnson McCandless came into the world with unusual gifts and a will not easily deflected from its trajectory he was an antisocial he always had friends everybody liked him he could go off and entertain himself for hours. He didn't seem to need toys or friends. He could be alone without being lonely. Now and then, um, his childhood was a stressful existence. Both Walt and Billy are tightly wound, emotional, loath to give ground. Kareen, his sister, says we learned to count on each other when mom and dad weren't getting along. Um, like I said, he had a bunch of other siblings, like six other siblings, but uh, but him and his sister were essentially the only two in that immediate family with, with Billy as the mother. Uh, and, and it did say in her, her book, uh, The Wild Truth, that they, they had a very close connection because of the you know, domestic violence that often went on and uh, they obviously came from that same environment so they understood each other, empathized with each other. Billy's dad, their grandfather on his mom's side, didn't quite fit into society, Walt explains. In many ways he and Chris were a lot alike. Chris was eight, Walt took him on his first overnight packing trip. A 
three-day hike in the Shenandoah to climb Old Rag. They made the summit, and Chris carried his own pack the whole way. Hiking up the mountain became a father-son tradition. They climbed Old Rag almost every year thereafter, so when he was eight years old, this kid was already hiking mountains. Um, I said before he didn't have too much outdoors experience, but, and I'm still sticking my guns on that. I don't think, um, I don't think he knew too much about hunting or, or actually surviving in the wild so much as he was just physically fit and able to you know, um, get along easily outdoors. There's, I feel like those are two different things, you know, just having knowledge and having physical, um, physical stature enough, stamina enough to, to actually make it out there. Anyways, Chris was fearless even when he was little. Walt says after a long pause, we didn't think the odds applied to him, or he didn't think the odds applied to him. We were always trying to pull him back from the edge. Chris thought that it was stupid rule and decided to ignore it. Um, oh, sorry, this is my haphazard highlighting here. He, uh, he was getting A's and B's in school, and basically this one science class required a specific format. On his science lab reports and, and uh, Chris was being a little anarchistic actually he ignored the formatting and uh, he did his lab reports but not in the correct format so the teacher gave him an F after talking with the guy I came home and told Chris he got the grade he deserved and I wrote here on the margin um, His father disapproved from a young age without apparent sympathy. And, and a little underline, I came home and told Chris he got the grade he deserved. Um, you know, it wasn't like a dad being like, I understand where you're coming from. You know, you, you don't want to do the format. It didn't seem like he, uh, he he actually wanted to sit down and explain to him why why he should do the format. He just, he just kind of, you know, brushed him off as uh, as being foolish, you know. Um, okay. Now on, on weekends when, uh, when McCandless was in high school, pals were attending keggers and trying to sneak into Georgetown bars. McCandless would wander the seedier quarters of Washington, chatting with prostitutes and homeless people, buying them meals, earnestly suggesting ways they might improve their lives. Chris didn't understand how people could possibly be allowed to go hungry, especially in this country, his mom says. He would rave about that kind of thing for hours. Now, eventually, the family purchased... Um, a townhome on the bay in a sailboat. They took the kids to Europe, skiing in Breckenridge, Colorado, on a Caribbean cruise. And Chris, Billy acknowledges, was embarrassed by all that. As uh, soon as high school was over, Chris declared he was going to get behind the wheel of his new car and spend the summer driving across country. So, and... I think I already, I think I already quoted this, but why not quote it again? Henry David Thoreau from Life in the Woods, Walden. Rather than love, than money, than fame, give me truth. I sat at a table where rich food and wine was in, was in abundance. An obse, uh, obsequious attendance, but sincerity and truth were not. And I went hungry from the inhospitable board. The hospitality was cold as the ISIS. A passage highlighted in one of the books found with Chris McCandless's remain. At the top of the page, the word truth had been written in large block letters in McCandless's hand. And then underneath, uh, 
another quote from uh, G.K. Chesterton. For children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. Near the end of his trip, it turned out Chris had gotten lost in the Mojave Desert, a, um, a summer trip he went on by himself before college and had nearly succumbed to dehydration. Chris was good almost at, at almost everything he tried, which made him supremely overconfident. Chris, says his mom, thought we were idiots for worrying about him. I saw Chris at a party after his sophomore year at Emory in college. A, uh, a friend of his remembers, and it was obvious he had changed. He, he seemed very introverted, almost cold. When I said, hey, good to see you, Chris, he replied with a cynical, yeah, sure, that's what everybody says. He didn't seem interested in the money, so far as the fact that he was good at making it. It was like a game, and the money was a way of keeping score. Those two little anecdotes I highlighted because it's just not the mainstream obviously this this that's why this kid's story is so compelling because he was so different and had such a different mindset than most people but to actually say to someone when they say hey good to see you chris after a year or something like that you know to say yeah sure that's what everybody says like uh it, it, you know, it, it's ballsy. It's, uh, it's very forward and direct. And um, that quote about, give me truth other than fame and money and fairness. He, uh, he it, it's true. He, he lived up to uh, his ideals. Um, and yeah, and that little anecdote about he didn't seem interested in the money. It was a game to him and money was just the score. A way to keep score. Uh, that was what his sister said. But of course, I wrote it's not when it's a matter of survival. You know, um, I, I certainly feel. Obviously, his parents, his dad was a famous, or not famous, just a very successful engineer. Uh, wrote programs for NASA and satellites and and, and um, all this stuff, and the Apollo missions. And although he had all this money. This kid, this poor kid, was being deprived of uh, emotional growth because his parents didn't give him any attention. And I, I know, I know personally, I know people like that in that situation. And I, I know people on the opposite, where their parents are loving and caring. And uh, yeah, sure, they can't afford a lot, you know. But I, I feel like the latter is more... Um, more beneficial to to a child's upbringing than just having money with no no personal um, you know no love no no personal support from your parents. So, anyways, uh, okay. It says he was also able to forgive or overlook the shortcomings of his literary heroes. Jack London was a notorious drunk. Tolstoy, despite his famous advocacy of celibacy, had been an enthusiastic sexual adventurer as a young man and went on to father at least 13 children, some of whom were conceived at the same time. The censorious count was thundering in print against the evils of sex. More and more, the classes he took at uh, Emory depressed and, um, I'm sorry, not depressed, um, addressed such pressing social issues as racism and world hunger and any inequities and in the distribution of wealth. Um, and uh, what I put here. Yeah. 
Yeah, just uh, his political views were actually pretty conservative for how liberal he could be labeled as with uh, respect to distribution of wealth and whatnot. He says um, in Henry David Thoreau's declaration in Civil Disobedience, I heartily accept the motto that government is best, which governs least, which is um, nowadays, from what I understand, that's more of a Republican view in, in America, at least I'm talking about. classes ended in the spring of 1989, Chris took his dots in on another prolonged extemporaneous trip. We only got two cards from him the whole summer, says his dad. The first one said he was heading to Guatemala, and then it turned out he changed his mind and actually went to Alaska. During his senior year at Emory, Chris lived off campus in his bare Spartan room furnished with milk crates and a mattress on the floor. Few of his friends ever saw him outside of class. A professor gave him a key for after access hours, uh, after hours access to the library where he spent much of his free time. And uh, more and more he was becoming secluded from his parents by, by choice, obviously. In the, uh, in the spring of 1990, when Walt, Billy, and Kareen attended his graduation ceremony, they thought he seemed happy as they watched him stride across the stage and take his diploma. He was grinning from year to year. Shortly thereafter, though, he donated the balance of his bank accounts, nearly $25,000, to Oxfam, loaded up his car, vanished from their lives. From then on, he scrupulously avoided contact, either from his parents or Corrine, the sister from, for whom he purportedly cared for immensely. Um, and then it says, Walt, Walt doesn't deny this. There's no question in my mind, he says, if we had any idea where to look, okay? I would have gone there in a flash, gotten a lock on his whereabouts, and brought our boy home. So, you see the uh, authoritative nature of him, even when his son's in college. He's, he's not worried about, not worried about why his son's leaving and, and, and um, disowning his parents. He's, he, he's just worried about the what and, and, you know, and that he doesn't have any authority over the kid anymore. It's really interesting like that. All right, so that was his childhood. Uh, yeah, it's not even... So I, I kept that relatively brief, and I think I'll be able to squeeze in the Alaskan adventure now. interior I highlighted um, this this quote at the beginning of this chapter here wilderness appealed to those bored or disgusted with man and his works it not not only offered an escape from society but also was an ideal stage for the romantic individual to exercise the cult that he frequently made of his own soul the solitude and total freedom of the wilderness created a perfect setting for either melancholy or exaltation and the amplification of, of both. This was by uh, Roderick Nash, 
wilderness in the American mind. Hitchhiking tends to be difficult on the Alaska Highway. However, just six days out of Carthage, he arrived, Chris arrived at Lear River Hot Springs at the, yeah, in the Yukon Territory. At 6.30 in the morning one time, a, uh, or one day after that, the ground still frozen hard. Um, this guy Gaylord Stuckey was surprised to find someone already in the street, uh, steaming water, a young man who introduced himself as Alex. When he told McCandless his destination, the boy exclaimed, Hey, that's where I'm going too. But I've been stuck around here for a couple days now trying to get a lift. Do you mind if I ride with you? Oh, uh, Jiminy stuck, he said. I guess he actually talked like that. I, uh, I'd, uh, I'd love to, son. But I can't. The company I work for has a strict rule against picking up hitchhikers, yada, yada, yada. Um, Alex was clean shaven, had short hair. I could tell by the language he used that he was a real sharp fella. He wasn't what you call a typical hitchhiker. I'm usually leery of him. I figure there's probably something wrong with a guy who can't afford a bus ticket. Stucky had come to enjoy McCandless's company so much, though, that he changed his mind and agreed to drive the boy the entire distance. Alex didn't come out and say too much at first. But it's a long, slow drive, and when we spent a total of three days together on that bus, and by the end of the, I guess by the end, he kind of let his guard down. I'll tell you what, he was a dandy kid, real courteous, and he didn't cuss or use a lot of that there slang. You could tell he came from a nice family. Mostly, he talked about his sister. McCandless was candid, but stucky about his intent to speed the summer alone, or spend the summer alone in the bush living off the land. He said it was something he'd wanted to do since he was little. Said he didn't want to see a single person. No airplanes, no sign of civilization. He wanted to prove to himself that he could make it on his own without anybody else's help. draw of independence, it's, uh, it's overwhelming. I, I, I can imagine what he's thinking at that point. <laughs> so, um, so Stucky drove to the University of Alaska campus on the west end of Fairbanks, dropped McCandless off at 5.30 p.m. Before I let him out, I told him, Alex, I've driven you a thousand miles, I've fed you. For three straight days, the least you can do is send me a letter when we get back from Alaska. When you get back, he promised he would. I also begged and pleaded with him for, uh, for him to call his parents. I can't imagine anything worse than having a son out there and not knowing where he's at for years. Not knowing whether he's alive or dead. He says, here's my credit card number. Please call them. All I said was, maybe, I, all he said was, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Um, so, perusing the classified ads, McCandless uh, found a gun, a uh, semi-automatic 22 caliber, caliber Remington with a 4x20 scope and a plastic stock. He bought a, a model car called the Nylon 66, no longer in production. It was a uh, favorite for Alaskan trappers because of its weight and reliability. He, uh, he spent about 125 bucks on it and, um, and then purchased four 400 hollow point long rifle shells from a nearby gun shop. Four miles west of town in the evening, Steve Joe McCandless pitched his tent on a patch of hard frozen ground surrounded by birch trees. He woke early on the morning of April 28th and walked to the side of the road at pre-dawn and was pleasantly surprised when he, when the first vehicle to come along pulled over to give him a lift. It was a gray Ford pickup with a bumper sticker on the back that declared, I fish, therefore I am, Petersburg, Alaska. 
The driver of the truck, an electrician on his way to Anchorage, wasn't much older than McCandless. His name was Jim Galleon. Three hours later, Galleon turned his truck off the highway and drove as far as he could down the unplowed side of the road when he dropped McCandless off at the Stampede Trail. He said the temperature was in the low 30s and dropping to the low teens that night. As a foot and a half of crusty spring snow covered the ground. The boy could hardly contain his excitement, though. He was at long last about to be gone in the vast Alaskan wilderness. The heaviest item in McCandless's half-full backpack was his library, nine or ten paperback books, and most of which had been given to him by Jan Burris. Among them were uh, Thoreau, Tolstoy, Gogol, but McCandless was no literary snob, he says. He simply carried what he thought he might enjoy reading, including mass market books by Crichton, Robert Pier Piercig, and Louis Lamour, or maybe Louis, I'm not sure if he's French or not, um, having neglected to pack writing paper. He began a laconic journal on some blank pages on the back of to Nana Plant Lore. By the time McCandless headed into the bush, there was open water flowing on most of the larger streams, and nobody had been very far down the trail for two or three weeks. Only the faint remnants of a packed snow machine track remained for him to follow. He never suspected that in doing so, um, following this trail, he was crossing his own Rubicon. To McCandless's inexperienced eye, there was nothing to suggest that two months hence, as the glaciers and snowfields of the Teklonikos had water, that's the main river he, uh, he couldn't get past. Um, swelled into ten times in volume, transforming the river into a deep, violent torrent that bore no resemblance to the gentle brook he'd blithely waded across in April. On May 1st, some twenty miles down the trail where he was dropped by Galleon, he stumbled upon the old bus on the, uh, beside the Shoshana River. It was outfitted with a bunk and a barrel stove, and previous visitors had left an improvised shelter stocked with matches, bug dope, and other essentials. In his journal, he writes, um, Magic Bus Day. And he decided to lay over for a while in the vehicle, taking advantage of uh, its comforts out there. He was, he was elated to be there inside the bus on a sheet of weathered plywood spanning a broken window. McCandless scrawled an exultant declaration of independence. And this is the, uh, the famous part in the actual movie. Uh, two years he walks the earth. No phone, no pool, no pets, no cigarettes. Ultimate freedom and extremist. An aesthetic voyager whose home is the road, escaped from Atlanta. Thou shalt not return, cause the West is the best. And now after two rambling years comes the final and greatest adventure. The climactic battle to kill the false being within and victoriously conclude the spiritual revolution. Ten days and nights of freight trains and hitchhiking bring him to the great white north. No longer to be poisoned by civilization, he flees and walks alone upon the land to become lost in the wild. Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. And then Krakauer says, Reality, however, was qu uh, quick to intrude on McCandless's reverie. He had difficulty killing game, and daily journal entries during the first week in the bush include weakness, snowed in, and disaster. 
He saw but did not shoot a grizzly on May 2nd, shot at but missed some ducks on May 4th, finally killed and ate a spruce grouse on May 5th, but he didn't shoot anything else until May 9th when he bagged a single small squirrel, by at which point he'd written Fourth Day Famine in the journal. But soon after, his fortunes took a sharp turn for the better, it says. The snowpack had melted down to the bare ground, exposing previous season's rose hips and flagon berries, which McCainless gathered and ate in great quantity. He also became more successful at hunting game, and for the next six weeks, feasted regularly on squirrels, spruce grouse, duck, goose, porcupine. On May 2nd, a crown fell off one of his molars, but he didn't even seem to let that dampen his spirits much, because the following day he scrambled up the nameless, hump-like, 3,000-foot butt that rises directly north of the bus giving him a view of the whole icy sweep of the Alaska Range and mile after mile of uninhabited country. His journal entry for that day characteristically terse but unmistakably unmistak joyous uh, red climb mountain exclamation point. McCandless had told Galleon that he intended to remain on the move during his stay in the brush. I'm just going to take off and keep walking west, he said. I might walk all the way down to the Bering Sea. It was slow going. I think, uh, I don't know if I have it highlighted here. Yeah. Okay, I'm about to read it. It was slow going in order to feed himself. He had to devote a large part of each day to stalking animals. Moreover, as the ground thawed, his route turned into a gauntlet of boggy musket egg and impenetrable alder. McCainless belatedly came to appreciate one of the fundamental, if counterintuitive, axioms of the North. Winter, not summer, is the preferred season for traveling overland through the brush. Faced with the obvious folly of his original ambition to walk 500 miles to the tidewater, he reconsidered his plan. The, uh, that's what I was about to mention. He was going to walk 500 miles in the Alaskan wilderness. On, uh, on May 19th, having traveled no further west than the Taklot River, less than 15 miles beyond the bus, he turned around. Ironically, the wilderness surrounding the bus, the patch of overgrown country where McCandless was determined to become lost in the wild, scarcely qualifies as wilderness by Alaskan standards. Less than 30 miles to the east is a major thoroughfare, the George Parks Highway. Just 16 miles to the south, beyond an escarpment of the Outer Range, hundreds of tourists rumble daily into the Denali Park over a road patrolled by the National Park Service. And unbeknownst to the aesthetic voyager, Krakauer calls McCandless, Scattered within a six-mile radius of the bus are four cabins, although none happened to be occupied during the summer of 92. But despite the relative proximity of the bus to civilization, for all purposes, McCandless was cut off from the rest of the world. He spent nearly four months in the bush, all told, and during that period, he didn't encounter another living soul. In the end, the Sashana River site was sufficiently remote to cost him his life. Porcupine, third porcupine, 
Squirrel Greyberg. On June 5th, he shot a Canada goose as big as a Christmas turkey. Then on June 9th, he backed the biggest prize of all, a moose. He recorded in the journal, overjoyed. The proud hunter took a photograph of himself kneeling over his truf trophy. You know, I, I, I think I might, um, since this is, yes, yeah, most likely going to be the last episode of for, for this book right here, I think I might go ahead and um, superimpose some some of these pictures that he took of himself because they're, they're pretty pretty cool pictures. Especially this moose head. And I've seen um, it's that moose head is literally the size of like. three basketballs, I guess, something, something we can all relate to, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's massive, it's, it must have weighed like 50 pounds, um, anyways, uh, although McCandless was enough of a realist to know that the, uh, the hunting game was an unavoidable component of living off the land, he, he'd always been ambivalent about killing animals, that ambivalence turned to remorse soon after he shot the moose. Alaskan hunters know that the easiest way to preserve meat in the bush is to slice it into thin strips and then air dry it on a makeshift rack. But Camus, in his naivety, relied on the advice of hunters he consulted in South Dakota, who advised him to smoke his meat. Not an easy task under the circumstances. Butchering extremely difficult, he wrote in his journal on June 10th, fly and mosquito hordes remove intestines, liver, kidneys, one lung, steaks, get hindquarters to leg to stream. June 11th, remove heart and other lung, two front legs and head, get, get rest to stream, haul near cave, try to protect with smoker. June 12th, remove half rib cage and steaks, can only work nights, keep smoker going. June 13th, Get remainder of ribcage, shoulder, and neck to cave. Start smoking. Maggots already on June 14th, he says. Smoking appears ineffective. Don't know. Looks like disaster. I now wish I'd never shot the most. One of the greatest tragedies in my life, he says. Henceforth, we'll learn to accept my errors, however great they be. Shortly after the moose episode, McCandless began to read Thoreau's Walden. In the chapter titled Higher Laws, in which Thoreau ruminates about the morality of eating, McCandless highlighted, When I had caught and cleaned and cooked and eaten my fish, they seemed not to have fed me essentially. I was in, it was insignificant and unnecessary. It cost more than it came to. The moose... McCainless wrote in the margin and in the same passage he marked The repugnance to animal food the repugnance to animal food is not the effect of experience, but of instinct. This is uh, Thoreau writing now. It appeared more beautiful to live low and fare hard in many respects, and though I never did so, I went far enough to please my imagination. I believe that every man who has ever been earnest to preserve his high or poetic faculties in the best condition has been particularly inclined to abstain from animal food and much from much food of any kind. It's hard to provide and cook so simple and clean a diet as will not offend the imagination, but this, I think, is to be fed when we feed the body should both sit down at the same table. Yet perhaps this may be done. The fruits eaten temperately need not make us ashamed of our appetites, nor interrupt the worthiest pursuits. But put an extra condiment into your dish and it will poison you. Yes, wrote McCandless, and two years later, or two pages later. Two, 
pages later, consciousness of food, with the word consciousness underlined, eat and cook with concentration, holy food. There he goes again with the religious references. On the back pages of the book that served as his journal, he declared, I am reborn, this is my dawn, real life has begun. Deliberate living, colon, conscious attention to the basics of life and a constant attention to your immediate environment and its concerns. Example, a job, a task, a book, anything requiring efficient concentration, circumstance has no value. It is how one relates a situation or relates to a situation that has value. All true meaning resides in the personal relationship to a phenomenon, what it means to you great holiness of food, the vital heat, positivism, an insurpassable joy of the life aesthetic, absolute truth and honesty, reality, independence, finality, stability, consistency. As McCainless gradually stopped rebuking himself for the waste of the moose, the contentment that began in mid-May resumed and seemed to continue through early July. Then in the midst of his idol, came the first two pivotal setbacks. Satisfied, apparently, with that he had learned, with what he had learned during his two months of solitary life in the wild, McCandless decided to return to civilization. It was, it was time to bring his final and greatest adventure to a close, and get back into the world of men and women, where he could chug a beer, talk philosophy, and throw all strangers with tales of what he'd done. He seemed to have moved beyond his need to assert so adamantly his autonomy his need to separate himself from his parents. Maybe he was prepared to forgive their imperfections. Maybe he was even prepared to give some of his own. McCandless seemed ready, perhaps, to go home. is my idea of happiness. And then on top of all that, 
you for a mate and children, perhaps. What more can the heart of a man desire? So on July 3rd now, McCainless shouldered his backpack and began the 20 mile hike to improve um, to the road. Two days later, halfway there, he arrived in heavy rain and had the beaver ponds that blocked access. Um, I don't know if I have it highlighted, but basically the trail, it's like the 20 mile trail is, is kind of smattered with these really rather large beaver ponds that are like 10, 15 feet deep at times. Um, so you have that obstacle and then he had the, um, uh, the main river, the Teclonica or Teclonica, um, which had, like I said just before, had swollen to about 10 times its size that it was before, uh, when he walked in early spring. So everything had thawed. It's about the, um, it's the beginning of July now. So everything's pretty much as thawed as it's going to get. And, uh, and he didn't realize it, uh, I guess I, maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but, um, either way, it was too much for him, and of course, you know, like I've said before, like it said before in the book here, too, uh, he wasn't a strong swimmer, um, if he could swim at all, I'm not sure if he could, so, anyways, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, two days later, halfway there, after July 3rd, so July 5th now, he, uh, he arrived in heavy rain at the Beaver Ponds, and that blocked access to the west bank of the Teclonica River. In April, they'd been frozen over and hadn't, hadn't presented much of an obstacle. Now he must have been alarmed to find a three-acre lake covering the trail that he, he hiked. He'd first crossed the river 67 days earlier in the freezing temperatures of April. It had been an icy but gentle knee-deep creek and he'd still been able to simply stroll across it. On July 5th, however, the Teclonica was at full flood swollen with the rain and snow melt from glaciers high in the Alaska range. If he could reach the far shore, the remainder of the hike to the highway would be easy. But to get there, he would have to negotiate a channel some 100 feet wide. McCandless was a weak swimmer and had confessed to several people that he was afraid of the water. Attempting to swim the numbingly cold torrent, or even to paddle, some sort of improvised raft, seemed too risky to consider. Just downstream from where he met the trail, um at the river. The Teclonica erupted in a chaos of boiling white water as it accelerated through the narrow gorge. Long before he could swim or paddle to the far shore, he'd be pulled under and into these rapids and most likely drown. In his journal now, he wrote, disaster reigned in, river looked impossible, lonely, scared. If McCainless head walked or so upstream, he would have discovered that the river broadened into a maze of braided channels. If he'd scouted carefully, trial by trial and error, he might have found a place where these braids were only chest deep. As strong as the current was running, it would have certainly knocked him off his feet, but by doggy paddling and hopping along the bottom as he drifted downstream, he could have conceivably have made it across. But it would have still been a very risky proposition. And at that point, McCandless had no reason to take such a risk. He'd been fending for himself quite nicely in the country. He probably understood that if he was patient and waited, the river would eventually drop to a level where he could safely uh, ford it. After weighing his options, therefore, he settled on the most prudent course. He turned around and began to walk back to the bus. Alright, for the last chapter here, I might have enough time, we'll see. Uh, quick quote by 
John M. Campbell in The Hungry Summer it goes, It is nearly impossible for modern man to imagine what it is like to live by hunting. The life of a hunter is a hard one, seemingly continuous overland travel. A life of frequent concerns that the next interception may not work. The trap or the drive will fail, or that the herds will not appear this season. Above all, the life of a hunter carries with it the threat and deprivation of death by starvation. subsisting for three months on an exceedingly marginal diet, McCandless had run up a sizable caloric deficit. He was balanced on a precarious edge. And then in late July, he made the mistake that pulled him down. He had just finished reading Dr. Zivago, a book that incited him to scribble excited notes in the margins and underline several passages one of which included Laura walked along the tracks following her path a path worn by pilgrims and then turned into the fields here she stopped and closing her eyes took a deep breath a breath of the flower scented air of the broad expanse around her it was dearer to her than to her kin better than a lover wiser than a book for a moment she rediscovered the purpose of her life she was here on earth to grasp the meaning of its wild enchantment and to call each thing by its right name. Or, if this were not within her power, to give birth out of love for the life to successors who would do it in their place. And then uh, McCainless prints nature slash purity on top of that page. And then the, the passage continues, Oh, how one wishes sometimes to escape from the meaningless dullness of human eloquence. From all those sublime phrases, to take refuge in nature, apparently so inarticulate, or in the wordlessness of long grinding labor of sound sleep, of true music, or of a human understanding rendered speechless by emotion. McCainless stared back and bracketed the paragraph. Oh, excuse me, starred and bracketed the paragraph and circled refuge in nature in black ink next to, and so it turned out that the only, that only a life similar to the life of those around us, merging with it without a ripple, is genuine life, and that an unshared happiness is not happiness. And this was the most vexing of all. He noted a happiness only real when shared. That's probably the the, the uh, most most memorable line from the the whole movie. And uh, Krakauer now writes it's uh, it's tempting to regard this latter notation as further evidence that McCandless is long lonely sabbatical changed him in some significant way. It can be interpreted to mean that he was ready perhaps to shed a little of the armor he wore around himself all the time. He, um, that returning to civilization, he intended to abandon the life of solitary vagabond 
to stop running so hard from intimacy and become a member of the human community. But we'll never know because Dr. Zabago was the last book he would read. Two days after he finished the book on July 30th, there's an ominous entry in the journal that says extremely weak, fault of potato seed, much trouble just to stand up, starving, great jeopardy. Before this note, there's nothing in the journal to suggest that McCandless was in dire circumstances. He was hungry, and his meager diet had pared his body down to a few feral scrawn of grism, gristle and bone. But he seemed to be in real and reasonably good health, it says. Then, after July 30th, His physical condition suddenly went to hell, and by August 19th he was dead. On August 12th, he dragged himself out of the bus to forge for berries after posting a plea, posting a plea for assistance in the unlikely event that someone would stop by while he was away. Written in meticulous block letters on a page torn from Gogol's Taurus Bulba, it reads, SOS, I need your help, I'm injured, near death, too weak to hike out of here. I'm all alone, this is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I'm out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you. He signed the note, Christopher McCandless, August. Recognizing the gravity of his predicament, he'd abandoned the cocky moniker he'd been using for years. Alexander Supertramp in the favor of the name given to him at birth by his parents. And the, uh, the last little bit is it's just an interesting observation or... I guess bit of research by the author uh, Krakauer. Starvation is not a pleasant way to expire. In advanced stages of famine, as the body begins to consume itself, the victim suffers muscle pain, heart disturbances, loss of hair, dizziness, shortness of breath, extreme sensitivity to cold, physical and mental exhaustion. The skin becomes discolored. Some people who have been Brought back from the edge of far, the far edge of starvation, the report that near the end of the hunger actually vanishes. The terrible pain dissolves and the suffering is replaced by sublime euphoria. A sense of calm accompanied by transcendent mental clarity. It would be nice to think McCandless experienced a similar rapture. So on August 12th, he wrote what would prove to be his final words in his journal, Blue, Beautiful Blueberries. On August 13th through 18th, his journal is just a tally of the days. At some point during the week, he tore the final page from um, Education of a Wandering Man on one side of the page. And um, there were some lines Lamore had quoted from Robinson. But um, on the other side of the page, he had said, I have had a happy life, and thank the Lord. Goodbye, may God bless all. On the other side, um, and then he crawled into a sleeping bag. His mother had sewn for him and slipped into unconsciousness. He probably died about 112 days after he'd walked out into the wild. After the last day, he tallied it. Only 19 days before six different Alaskans from three different groups would uh, would merge on the bus on the same day. One of his last acts was to take a picture of himself, standing near the bus under the Alaska sky, one hand folded, holded, holding his final note towards the camera, and the other raised in a brave, beatific farewell. His face is really emaciated emaciated skeletal almost but if he pitied himself in those last difficult hours because he was so young because he was so alone because his body had betrayed him and his will was failing it's not apparent from the photograph he's smiling in the picture there's no mistaking the look in his eyes 
Chris McCandless was at peace, serene as a monk to God. Alright, that's really it. That's all I got for you guys. So, um, I'll, I'll see you next time.